Our scripture reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Last uh, few weeks ago, we took a little detour to take a look at Yom Kippur, the greatest holiday in the Jewish calendar and a holiday very important for believers. And now we are returning back to our series through the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9. We'll begin reading with verse 10 and read through verse 24. Romans 9, beginning with verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Not only so, but also when Rebekah, that is Isaac and Rebekah, had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they, that is the twins, were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might stand, not because of works, but because of his call. She was told, the older, that is Esau, will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, Megenetoi. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honored use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory? or vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So for the reading of God's word this morning from Romans 9, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open because we're going to be referring to chapter 9 quite a bit. Well, friends, this is the text that has convinced more people to embrace the sovereignty of God in predestination than any other text in the Bible, in all likelihood. I mean, verses 11 through 13 just can't really argue with them. It's so clear. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might stand, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. This text makes it so clear that God chooses to save a person solely based on his decision and nothing in us. God elects apart from anything that we do. He elects without conditions in us. Everybody believes in election, but we believe that God's election is unconditional. And that's what the text says here in Scripture. Before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad. <laughs> There's nothing that we do or inherently in us that contributes to God's choice. And verse 16 sums up predestination probably the best. And that's why we have that memorized by our kids for the five points, the Tulip Festival, right? Verse 16 says, So then, 
It depends not on human will or effort or work, but on God who has mercy. Now, how do many folks respond when they hear the truth about God's sovereignty and salvation? Well, it's not something you bring up at most uh, parties here, but these objections you would not only hear now, but also throughout time. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? You know, Paul just lays out the case, and you can hear the people saying, is there injustice on God's part? What's the objection? Most people hear this, and they say, that's not fair. Right? Exactly. And they're probably thinking, you know, what if my choice is different from God's choice? Why is it that Jeffrey Dahmer uh, gets to go to heaven? I don't know. I haven't watched the Netflix. I don't watch. I don't have Netflix. But um, I heard there's a new series with Dahmer. I wonder, at the end of Dahmer's life, uh, this is, I think, true, he actually met a chaplain in prison. And uh, from all accounts, um, repented of his sins and trusted in Christ before he was killed. So if that's true, why is it that Jeffrey Dahmer gets to go to glory, but Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who did a ton of good work, but arguably said there are many ways to get to God, why would Mother Teresa doesn't? Or you know, what if I'm shut out of eternal life when my rotten relative isn't? Predestination, we can think of all these scenarios. It, it just seems so unfair. And that's the objection, verse 14. It's not fair. But I think that people who don't like the justice of predestination show that they do not understand or really do not like the nature of God and who we are. And let me explain. It's very clear, and I think indisputably clear, that we and everybody, we are born thinking quite highly of ourselves. We naturally think highly of our community, our family, and certainly we think highly of ourselves. And although nobody would say that he or she is perfect, and many will admit that they actually do have some moral flaws, we are born with the opinion that we give ourselves passing or even high grades if we had to grade our moral condition in our hearts, we give ourselves passing grades and maybe even high grades for our moral fitness. We do tend to think that we are, you know, good people. So-and-so is good people, right? Well, we kind of think of ourselves as we're good people. Well, if our starting point in listening to God's word in Romans 9 is that I am a passably good person, and if, in fact, I am a reasonably good person, and it's also true that there are certainly many, many people who are not as good as I am, that's obvious, right? If you look around, you can say, well, there are a lot of people who, aren't, who are screw-ups and not as good as I am. Then it is unfair for God to have mercy on people who are morally worse than me, so the thinking goes. It's unfair for God to favor bad people over good people, or so it seems. And that's really the uh, objection to predestination. Not just that it's God's choice, but that God might choose poorly. What about these objections to Romans 9 and God's sovereignty? Could God make a mistake by choosing someone who is worse than me and less deserving than I am? Is that possible? 
The key problem with this whole line of thinking and with these objections is that they think too highly of themselves. We all think that we are good people, when in reality, there is no such thing. In verse 11 and verse 13 in our text, where God said, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated, instead of thinking that Esau got a bad deal, we need to remember that both Jacob and Esau were terrible people. They were both bad in the eyes of a holy, righteous God. You know, repeat after me, at least in your minds, there is no such thing as a good person. And I was not born a good person. And neither were you. That is the clear teaching of Scripture. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 says, Cursed by God is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in God's law. That's, Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 19, right? Uh, in fact, like the rich young ruler, <laughs> we hear God's law and we say, yeah, not perfect, but I've done that, right? That in itself is abhorrent to God. In Luke chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, God says that when we justify ourselves, it's actually an abomination in the sight of God. Luke 16, verse 15 and following, Jesus said to uh, the Pharisees who are lovers of money, you are those who justify yourselves, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Luke 16. We just read from the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer that it would ask, can we perfectly love God and our neighbor as God commands? And what does the Heidelberg correctly sum it up? It says, no, I have a natural tendency to hate God and hate my neighbor. Friend, you and I and everybody, we are bad people in the eyes of a holy God. Really bad. Jacob was bad. Esau was bad. And in our text, Pharaoh was bad. They're all bad. Look at verse 17 and 18. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I've raised you up. I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then God has mercy on whomever he wills, and God hardens whomever he wills. Pharaoh was bad, and God allowed Pharaoh to continue to be bad. God let the wet concrete of a bad human nature set, as it were. Do you want more evidence that we are bad? Well, it's in our text, but it's in our hearts also. We stand in judgment over God. <laughs> thinking that we are better choosers than he is. We really say, you know, is God going to get this right? I'm not really sure I trust him to make the right choice. And that's what's behind verses 19 through 21. You will say to me, well, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Well, what is molded? Say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honored use and another for dishonorable use? We set ourselves up as God's equal. And we basically point our finger at God and say, what have you done? Why does he still find fault? There is injustice on God's part. Friend, our race, our human race, is, is sad and pathetic after the fall. 
we not only rebel against God and disobey his commands, we refuse to see our sin. We set ourselves against God as his equal, and we think that we can judge God. You know, really, it's, it's terrible. The, our country, our culture deserves the wrath of God. And so do I. And so do you. Well, again, come to an Orthodox Presbyterian church and think, wow, this is a lot of bad news. These people are depressed. Is there any good news in our text? Of course, yes. For God's reasons and according to God's plan, he doesn't allow all of us bad people to perish under his just wrath. God actually, for his reasons, he loves the bad Jacobs. God has mercy on stiff-necked rebels like me. And let's look at our text again, verses 22 through 24. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called. It's clear we're all born as vessels of wrath prepared for a just destruction, verse 22. But out of all these vessels who deserve destruction, there are some of these vessels on whom God shows what? Mercy. The default option is vessels of wrath, but God in some cases gives mercy instead of justice. That is, if you had to pick one theme, Again, this so clearly teaches predestination. But if there's one overriding theme that occurs over and over and over in our text, what's that word? It's mercy. God shows mercy in many cases. Mercy, verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Mercy in verse 16, so it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Mercy in verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Mercy in verse 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. God is just but also God has mercy on many, all of whom deserve wrath. And he not only doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, but according to verse 23, per his mercy, he actually prepares us for glory. Some really, really bad people end up in glory. Jeffrey Dahmer, me, you who trust in Christ. And isn't that beautiful? That God saves some of the sewer rats. God saves even you and me. God saves bad people. First, uh, by working outside of you. You cannot save yourself, right? That's clear from Matthew 19. We just heard that. It is impossible for man to have eternal life. So God saves bad people first by working completely outside of you. And he does this, or he did this, by sending Jesus to be your substitute. He showed mercy by sending Christ to be your substitute, to take all of your terrible sins on himself. 
and suffering God's wrath and curse in your place. But further, Jesus continues his saving work as substitute by having perfectly obeyed all of God's commands, as we heard this morning. The only truly good person, per Matthew 19, right? There is only one who is good. There's only one who's perfectly kept the law, and that is Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man. And he credits his righteousness to bad people. Jesus is your substitute in removing your bad, and Jesus is your substitute in securing your good. All this was done by God in Jesus Christ, completely outside of you and your desires and your plans. And then secondly, that's the first thing God does to, when he has mercy. He works outside of us in Christ 2,000 years ago. But then, secondly, God saves by working inside of you now. When God sends his Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of bad people like Jacob, like me, so that you see how great your sin and misery truly are. Does that sound familiar? That's Heidelberg Q&A too, isn't it? What three things must you know? First, how great my sin and misery truly are. You see how great your sin and misery truly are, present tense. You see that you have arrogantly broken God's laws and then had the audacity to stand in judgment over God. That you stop thinking you're a good person and that you throw yourself on the rich, deep mercy of the living God, receiving all that he has done for you in Christ 2,000 years ago. You then, friend, will pass from a deserved wrath into the riches of his mercy in Christ and into the glory of the blessing of God. That's remarkable. God in Christ does good to bad people who rest in him. You know, we start with the ugly truth about ourselves, and we, by God's grace, see God's mercy in Jesus Christ and rejoice in the glory that Christ secures for all bad people who trust in him. That's the message of Romans 9. That is the beauty of God's sovereign plan in predestination. It shows the mercy and the love of God in Christ Jesus to all bad people who rest in him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you did not treat us as we deserve to be treated. Lord, there are so many, by nature, uh, we rebel against your justice. We accuse you, even though we are the ones who are the rebels. We are the terrible people, and yet we have the gall and audacity to stand in judgment over you. Lord, we thank you, you did not leave us in that condition but you sent your spirit to work in our hearts. That we would come to, that we would see ourselves as you see us, as the bad Jacobs that we are. And that we would throw ourselves on your mercy that you offer to us in Christ's finished work. Lord, we thank you for the rich mercy of your grace. We thank you that you have taken vessels that should have been uh, preserved for destruction and you've taken these vessels and you've shown mercy on us and you've now prepared us for glory. We praise you for your rich mercy. 
Father, we pray that we would rejoice in your sovereign plan, in your predestination, in your mercy, and that we would share this good news to other Jacobs, other people who self-justify, other people who hold themselves over God. <laughs> and we pray that you would not treat them as their sins deserve, just like you, didn't, you had mercy on us, and that you would work in their hearts as well, Lord. We pray for your ongoing grace. And we pray all these things in the name of our Savior. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.